Okay, guys. Well, I am delighted to have today's guest with us all the way from the Gold Coast in Australia. Um, I was over in Los Angeles with my wife. I think it was three years ago. And myself and my wife bumped into today's guest. And since then, I was saying to myself, we should do a podcast. We should do a podcast. And we've only just got round, got round to reaching out to our guest today. So I'm delighted to welcome Mark Carroll. Mark, thank you for joining me. Absolute pleasure to be on. I appreciate having me. Thank you. Well, listen, yeah, we're in LA and I think your now fiance, Lauren, was competing. Am I right? Yeah, I think, geez, when was that? Three, is it three or I think it was longer, uh, maybe 2019, I think. Definitely, obviously, pre-COVID. Um, but yeah, I think 2019, she was competing at Worlds, um, I think, in the Bahamas over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, so I think that LA was a stop and, you know, you go to Gold's Gym and you run into about 100 people you know on the <laughs> other side of the world every time. It's a cool place. And you, and you don't expect to. Like, I was there and I was chatting to people and it... Uh, it blows your mind what impact the things that we do has on people or the visibility that you think you don't have and then people bumping into you. So uh, it's, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to, for us to have a conversation. I know that you've been, you've been at this a good while and with every episode that I do, I, you know, I want to interview coaches that are coaches, coaches that have made an impact, but also made an impact, not just in the coaching world, but also create meaningful impact for yourself. Um, and I think at the end of the day, building something of substance to give back. Also, you deserve to get back for yourself for the work that you put in. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to kind of getting packed into this. Um, I understand from your journey, you, much like me, you started as a PT, right? Yeah. Um, PT is all I've ever known. You know, I did it straight from school. So I think I started when I was obviously 18 or so. And yeah, I'm 34, 35 next month. So literally it's all I've ever done. And, you know, it's just, it's a different world these days as, you know, kind of chatted about before, like, you know, social media and stuff like that. And you know, I often talk about how people see fitness these days as this kind of glamorous thing and being a trainer online and stuff like that. And, you know, when I got into it back in the day, it, it wasn't the, oh man, you're going to get in this to become rich and famous and popular and stuff like that. It was just, hey, I like fitness and it was something I was good at. And yeah, so it's just always just kind of been something I enjoyed and was good and had a bit of skills in it. And I think probably just because I was passionate about it. And yeah, and so 16 years on or something, which is pretty scary, makes me feel old saying that. Um, yeah, so it's um, even though my my career is a little bit different now with kind of having a bit more business side stuff, I still coach people. I still have 20 online clients privately because that's always my key is always want to keep learning, keep um, applying and stuff like that. And I do all my private online clients still on Sundays when I'm not working on my business. So Sundays is my online client day. And obviously with my business, you know, it's a a one man show from a standpoint of programming. I'm the only coach. So I, you know, write every single program and do all the videos, every, all that stuff. So yeah, it's always, yeah, it's, it's what I do, I guess. Well, look, I mean, I think to give everybody an insight into kind of where we're going to get with this, um, you've got a pretty sizable business now online, if I'm right, selling hundreds of thousands of, um, digital, digital programs, projects, products, courses. Um, across physique building, muscle building, comp prep. Um, am I right? Just to give us some context to kind of what you do now. I know we talked about personal training and we'll pack up everything in between, but I'd like to get an understanding of kind of like what's happened on your coaching journey, but also where you've ended up to give people an idea where we'll end up in this podcast. What's the, what's the business now? The business currently, I guess, is primarily selling more cheaper programs, you know, something that's a bit more financially friendly for a lot of people. So around that, you know, 129 USD mark or something like that, you know, so, so I have about 20 different programs, 20, 22, 23, and then I have challenges as you do um, probably, I think five a year. And then I'm about to launch a premium um, online coaching business, which has been something I've been meaning to do for a long time where I'll have coaches under me and kind of like a real high level kind of thing. And I also have an education company with my brother, Glenn Carroll, and we um, have a certificate three and four in fitness, which is basically an internationally recognized PT certification. So we have students in the UK, America is a big one, um, getting certified with us. And also we have courses on program design primarily, um, yeah, to help clients or coaches, sorry, um, 
improve their program design. That's like a, my big passion is creating programs, periodization, things like that. And so, yeah, we have hundreds of coaches around the world also using our program design, which is cool. So yeah, so it's able to influence, I guess, people on lots of different levels, you know, people starting out um, in the gym, people much more advanced um, with my programs, but then also um, what's also cool is being able to educate coaches and have them use your methods and then apply them to their clients to get great results. So that's kind of, I guess, in a, a nutshell, kind of what I'm doing oh, yeah. these days. I love that. I love that. Well, look, you've developed your reputation for coaching, you know, now obviously with all the various different programs, but your reputation for, for coaching females and physiques, right? Um, I'd like to start today's uh, conversation off by asking you a question. What does mastery mean to you? Oh, I like that question. Um, I think mastery is something where you're at a level where things just come so natural to you and it just, things just feel easy and you're able to, I think, solve complex situations really, really simply. And I guess at the moment I'm building an onboarding system for all the coaches that we'll be hiring going forward and one of the things I've realized is a lot of things you do as a coach, say in client situations, it just comes so natural. But it's actually quite hard to then teach how you would make those decisions, um, you know, when to manipulate calories or carbohydrates or what or whatnot. And I think mastery comes down to a few things. It's coming down to experience, continued continued learning, um, a lot of trial and error over the years and years and years and years, and then forming somewhat of a system of how you do stuff. Like I'm, I'm a big believer that, you know, a lot of times these days people talk about, you know, the importance of personalized, co you know, coaching and stuff like that. And that that's true to some degree, but I think it's important as a coach as well to know who you are as a coach and not try to be a coach for basically everyone in the world. You know, I've got my systems and uh, how I do stuff and the clients I'm looking for. And the way I kind of look at, the way I kind of look at mastery is you're not kind of trying to be a bit of this and a bit of that. You're trying to be really, really great at something. And, you know, being elite, doesn't mean you have to be the world's greatest at everything as as a coach you know so I, I i try to kind of center on what i'm good at and i think mastery is probably quite hard to do if you're trying to be a bit of this a bit of that or or something for everyone so i think it's really also knowing who you are as a coach and who you want to work with and then doing that over and over and over again I love that. how did you find out who you were as a coach how did that how did that journey from personal training which i'm sure like me you're in a you're in a warm country i wasn't but uh, you know i trained everybody um and you and i both know the polyquin world and especially in australia it was very very popular with charles and, and and everything that he taught but one thing that i was trying to be put into when i was working in my first gym was hey to go up the grades, we need you to do this and check and this and something else or something else and then at one point i said to myself no I came back from Charles's one of his seminars and I was I was looking at this whole idea of muscle and I just went no you're trying to tell me to do all this holistic you know bosu balls swiss ball stuff and check stuff no and I, and I kind of found what I wanted to do and then I stopped with that how did you how did you get to the point where you found you as a coach and then that led you into dialing into what you do I guess I'm always kind of evolving, you know, even what I'm doing right now is probably different to a year ago, or two years ago. I'm kind of always trying to evolve into some degree, but I think, I think, you know, when you probably five, seven, eight years into the industry and initially you probably don't do a lot of education and stuff like that. And you get into it and then you start learning and then you start to be thinking, oh, wow, these guys are geniuses. They're so much smarter than me and all this stuff. And you start to feel quite almost def deflated because you don't feel like you know that much, but then all of a sudden you start to piece things together and i think for me was when i started to do a lot of different education and even talk to a lot of coaches behind the scenes like you know Polygon and stuff like that you realize they're just normal people and they have strengths they have weaknesses and for me it was what i always kind of like to kind of joke about with people when i talk about it. it's like i i like to think of myself kind of like a frankenstein you know you, you take a piece of this a piece of that you're not trying to be the next Polygon. you're not trying to be the next anyone you're just trying to be you and part of being i think a really good coach is understanding that hey this you might really like a coach and look up to them but you don't need to take everything you learn from them so you might take one thing from a person you enjoy and then you take another thing from a person you enjoy and then i remember a couple of years ago it was when i was starting to learn a lot about periodization and stuff like that and with you know undulating stuff like that and a lot of the polygon stuff wasn't really aimed too much at physique competitors but that's when i started to put more my spin on it how can i incorporate some of these base principles to more hypertrophy base work for bikini competitors how can i take 
key principles of say periodization for undulating and stuff like that and incorporate it into what people are doing now and kind of piece things together to I guess become more of a system of what I want to do and you know you start to realize that everyone has flaws and sometimes a lot of the stuff you're learning is like "Mm, you know how truthful is that or how correct is that or you know there's certain in courses you, you learn a lot of black and white you know people like to teach black and white in a lot of courses back in the day and the longer you start to do it, the more you start to have a bit more, I think, critical uh, thinking to situations and what you learn. It's like, you know, is that that true? And a big part, though, is for me, I was for about five, six years ago, you know, I was lecturing around the world. I traveled around the world. I was doing lecturing to co- um, coaches and stuff like that. And even when you're teaching, you start to, f- I think teaching is always a really cool thing because you start to realize like kind of who you are and how, how you talk and how you act. And even when you're t- teaching, you start to teach and things or um, you more so get excited on certain topics and you start to realize what you enjoy, who you are and what you actually really believe in, what you maybe are just saying because you've learned that. And, you know, so for me, it was always a period of learning a lot, but then applying and I, when I was lecturing and stuff like that, I was still doing 50, 60 clients a week and applying that. So a big thing back on the mastery is I think a lot of these coaches these days, they don't really coach anyone, you know, it, they, they learn a lot and then parrot a lot of that information online and, make it look really nice on social media. I'm often like, you've never put any of that into place that you're saying. So just because you're saying this and it sounds good and sounds smart, like for me, it's always like, well, do you have actual you know, evidence that you've actually put that into place with someone? Like, what are your results? And for me, I've always been passionate about results. And, you know, on social media, I put a lot of results out and I was doing that years ago before many people were really doing it online um, with a lot of the clientele I work with. And that's what really got my name out there. It was, it was a combination of, I want to know a lot, but I also want to be able to apply. You know, it's not knowledge learned if it's not applied and consistently done. And I think for me, I realized I was pretty good at what I was doing because every single client was just like a nailing the result over and over and over. And it wasn't just the same kind of client. It was different client, different situation, different goals, different requirements. But each one, I was able to keep delivering result after result. Um, and that's for me was probably the big confidence builder when you're, you know, there's no better feeling as a coach if you actually care about what you're doing and actually being a real coach than seeing people get results. You know, they come in, set goals, and then at the end, they've nailed those goals. For me, that's what really, I think, built up my confidence and made me think, all right, this is who I want to be as a coach. If, if we could put four or five pillars down that would, that would allow you to say, no, I call you a coach. What would you define as a coach? Well, number one, obviously, you need to work with people, which is there's a big difference between having you know, a coach in your name on social media and just putting out social media content that looks good, looks edited and stuff like that. You know, and there's a difference between, you know, I, I maybe feel differently to a lot of people these days, but I, I think a coach is someone who's had endless years of real experience with people, you know, in the gym, you know, I've, yeah, I do online now, but primarily I do online just because of the way the world is, you know, you've got people want to work with you around the world. It's hard to do that, it, you know, if, in your, in a gym, in the local kind of suburbs and stuff like that. But I think for a coach, it's number one, it's, you know, experience consistently coaching people. And as I say, I still do it these days. It's consistently learning, investing into education, um, applying that information. And yeah, it's just, it's just having that ability to constantly work on your craft. And it's hard to work on your craft is, you know, hey, I'm a pilot, but I don't fly planes, you know, just because you've done the certifications or you got qualified to be a pilot, you know. So that's for me, it's it's always a matter of how can I keep getting better at what I do. Every, every You know, every client to me, I, I like to say is a clinical trial. So every client's different, you know, like you know, look at all the research, all the studies and, you know, a lot of the studies that you take away from a study is, you know, the the average, but there's always outliers on either end. And, you know, often you get clients and you work with outliers and it's the ability to be able to, yes, get results with that kind of standard person, but can you get a result with that outlier and things like that? When it comes to the subject of teaching, You've, you've, you've covered this a few minutes ago, which absolutely fascinates me when I talk to skilled coaches, because you, it's hard to hold back the passion to teach others. And that stems from the passion on the gym floor, I'm sure with you. How important has been, you know, we see on social media, so many people, as you've said, regurgitating something, but not knowing something to the coaching process. How important has been the education to the individual clients for you? And how would a coach get better at teaching? Because it sounds like what you said a few minutes ago was you teaching your clients and even people on the gym floor gave you this ability to, to, to segment 
the information that you liked and didn't like. I mean, I took a lot from Charles and went, I don't like that. But then for me to challenge what I liked and didn't like, I needed to come from an educated base. And then I would say, I'm going to add this in. I've heard it from somebody else. But, you know, personally, the way I was working with Jampop clients, the way Charles taught program design, like what you said, didn't really fit for me. I didn't want to go through strength and then hypertrophy and then endurance. And I was like, that doesn't work for me. And also for me, strength phases isolated for me didn't work for me. But it was the kind of breaking down of the information I was learning and then teaching it to other people and saying, I can't see that working. How does a coach, you know, get better at teaching the things that they're learning so that they can develop confidence in their own decision making? I think for me, the biggest confidence builder has always been results. And so if you are going to say, think differently and go against the grain or go against, you know, one of the best minds that, you know, in the, at the time, it's all good to say, Hey, I've got a theory that maybe you can do things differently, but then you also want to back up that theory with evidence and evidence is by then doing something different going out and doing it, getting a result, and then repeatedly getting a result, you know, not just do it. Any 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 coach in the world can diet someone down and get a transformation, you know. I'm sure you know full well that there's a lot of coaches out there, you know, put them on an aggressive deficit and what. But, you know, for me, it's always about evidence. Can You know, can you prove that you can do what you say you can for people? And, again, I, I'll probably keep going back to it. It's just it, it's about that just repetition, you know, you know. So working with people, consistently applying what you do. Like, I remember – uh, for me, I, I started off actually in the industry, funny enough, doing like group training. I was teaching things like park fitness, circuit classes, boxing classes, 30, 40, 50 people. And for me, that was super valuable because it gave me the confidence to people and and ha- how to handle a big room. And, you know, here I was an 18 year old doing like a boxing class of like 50 middle-aged women, mums or whatever in a park and stuff like that. And even just doing that, you know, built a lot of confidence, built a lot of, um, you know, foundational skills. And then, you know, the more you do it, the more you get better at it and through repetition. So I remember as well, when I used to lecture, the first time you started lecturing, it was kind of, you know, how do I talk? Do I move around? How loud do I talk? Like, who am I? You know, you, you kind of doubt yourself or you're trying to figure out. And then, you know, as we spoke about kind of mastery, it's kind of through that repetition, through repeated efforts, you start to realize more about who you want to be or who who you are. And I think a lot of it just comes back to natural, you know, what feels natural and that comes often natural at the start, nothing feels natural. So if you're trying to teach someone something, if you don't really know it that well, it's hard to teach. But that's why, again, the more you know something, the easier it becomes. You know, So that's why you know, if you're a personal trainer starting out, you often doubt yourself when you say stuff. So you, it doesn't come off too confidently. But when you've done it for a long time, you've got proof that what you're doing works. I think that is a huge part or huge component of having the ability to teach when you actually truly believe in what you do. Like I know you're obviously in... A lot of the business world with um fitness and one of the things i see like yeah uh, I, I obviously I, I sell a lot on social media and people like often get asked me like are you is it hard to sell like don't you find it hard to sell i'm like no because i truly believe in what i'm selling like i know my products are that good i know that i can for whatever the value it is the price it is i know i'm going to bring 50x the value so it's a lot easier to say teach or sell whatever you do if you a know what you're doing really well and also you truly really believe in what you're doing as well so this gap what you've just explained is and we see this a lot in the online world moving into the online world without any credibility without any confidence without the certainty that you've just explained and expecting to sell before you've earned that and i think this is an interesting world because in in the personal training world that you and i started in um, the only way to be able to get clients was to build your confidence and do repetition on the gym floor. There was no, I can get a thousand followers and at least get some clients without any credibility. And now there is a, there is a way where coaches are getting clients, but then they're getting clients and they have this inability to get results because they've jumped ahead and made a promise on something that they don't truly believe. And I think that that's the marketing element that's almost given coaches the ability to get a lot of clients quickly without necessarily having proven themselves and therefore struggling to retain the actual customer. So I I, I think though on that. Do you know what I mean by that? Of, yeah, but I, and that's the thing though, like if if a lot of people these days on social media can build a big audience, majority of the time they're building a big audience off how they look. Yeah. So when they're trying to then sell a program that can help other people, they often struggle because really they're not they don't really have receipts that what they've done helps other people. All they know is what they do 
has helped with them and they look a certain way. And often how they look is not probably going to be majority of the clientele who needs their services and help, you know? So mm-hmm. if you're a jacked, you're naturally a jacked person and, you know, everything's come easy to you, you then trying to, you know, sell programs on mass or coaching on mass to, you know, middle-aged people who don't have any goals to be shredded or jacked or use um, 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 steroids and things like that. They really then struggle to, I think, talk to those people, communicate to those people, and even just passionately get their services out because I don't think they actually have obviously done it. They haven't, you know, it's a, it's always so much easier, I think, to, you know, talk confidently about anything and passionately when you've done it over and over and over again. It just feels natural. And, you know, you when, when you truly believe in something, it's a lot easier to, you know, communicate it and get it out there. And then, of course, also retain people. What I'm picking up from you is, I mean, you love this. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I think this is something that, that we both have in common. And I think nowadays it's like, I think people love the idea of the money of online. But a topic that I'd like to discuss with you is the importance of actually loving this. Because, you know, I, I've seen your work. I see you speak. The certainty, but passion that comes through you is it, it, it's, it's a natural inbuilt sales tool that you don't have to learn sales if you actually love what you do because people buy into you how important uh has that been to you and then also your own advice to people that are you know potentially trying to make their way through this without actually loving what they do you know i think the fitness industry is quite an interesting one because you kind of get two blends i found in the last few years you, you know you had unfortunately a lot of great coaches who and I did courses with, I'm sure you've done courses with, but then when social media came on, they kind of stuck their head in the sand a bit. We're like, no, I don't want to do this. This is beneath me. You know, I'm a great coach and stuff like that. And unfortunately, then the industry kind of passed them by in a lot of ways from getting their great knowledge out there and allowed the rise of people who were more so 90% content creators, 10% trainers. I, I often feel like a lot of the vast majority of the fitness industry is people who want to be known, want to be popular, want to be famous, want to make money. And fitness is just their vehicle to get there. It's not that they're an actual coach. They're 95% content creator. And that's something I often struggle with. And, you know, I have a social media I post every day. And honestly, I absolutely hate social media. But my drive of getting my knowledge and what I have to offer out there over um, wins out over, you know, my constant um, kind of hate of social media, you know, for everything you know, social media has given me a lot, you know, gives, every, you know, there's pros and cons of everything. And, you know, as long as the pros exceed the cons, then great, but it's, it's a hard place. But I think a lot of the time though, with social media and in general, you as a coach, you can get really frustrated with it because you like see other people Like for me, you know, there's always going to be people who look better than me and more jacked and, you know, beautiful people and stuff like that. But what I've realized, you know, I, I, I built, you know, a business the last four or five years we've almost never ever taken my shirt off majority of the time you know never have competed never you know my business is always about my clients and stuff like that so I, I just always feel like from a standpoint of you know getting yourself out there for me it always came natural because my thing was coach Mark Carroll I wanted to be the coach I wanted to be like hey here's what I'm doing with my client and just by organically you know, putting out what I'm doing with other people, it made, I, 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 I personally think it makes people think, oh, well, that could be me rather than just go, hey, here's my bicep workout. Here's my abs. Here's what I'm doing in my prep. That's great. And yes, you'll get engagement and stuff like that. But my big thing has always just been that having the ability to share other people's journeys who are working with you and show them getting results. And, you know, often I've showed, you know, you show people journey of where they started and two years later, your clients are with you and they're still getting better and better and better. I think just naturally just sharing that journey helps really show people, you know, you're a real coach, you mean business and stuff like that. You're, you're selling you as a coach rather than you as a six pack. I think that, 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 that what you've, you, what you've kind of come down to here is yes, people will always buy into you, but if people are following you just because of the way that you look, if they were following you because of potentially what people look like, but also what they do and how much they care. Do you think that's an important aspect that coaches consider adding in maybe as a missing link within their brands? Well, here's the thing, right? Like the power of personal brand is, you know, stronger than ever these days, you know, like personal brands, everything. That's why you see people like the rock and stuff, you know, they make all this money off these other joint ventures and whatnot. 
because of who they are, not because of their quality of the tequila and whatnot. But I think a lot of the times, so though, coaches can get caught up in the chasing of popularity and the chasing of sharing their story. And that's great. You know, like you often hear like, oh, it should be a reality TV show. But for me, it's always been, well, I personally think I'm boring. I don't think I'm you know, interesting and stuff like that. But I think my clients are interesting. I think their goals are super exciting. And I, most importantly, I think their progression week to week and month to month and is that's what's super super exciting and just by just by kind of doing that you know and sharing your results and sharing your clients journeys you know i you know before i learned anything about marketing and business you know i'd already sold you know hundred thousand training programs and when i started to read about marketing books and stuff like that i realized not on purpose but i was actually kind of doing what people talked about you know having a story behind your results having you know your marketing kind of showing a journey between you know point a and point b and that was it was never the plan but by kind of doing that you get people invested and i'm a big believer that that when people see when they see you put out a result of someone who looks kind of like them or their starting point it instantly triggers in their mind, hey, you know what? That could be me. That's real. And and that's the power of also getting results because it makes people truly think, well, if that person can do it, then why not me? And if he's doing it with that person and then that person and that person looks like me and that person looks like me, then maybe, you know, it's possible. Whereas if you're always just putting out on content, you just looking amazing, you looking perfect, I just feel like it's quite unrelatable. And I remember, you know, eh, often joke about it with my brother and stuff like that is that you know if you look at personal trainers and why i think a lot of personal trainers struggle in gym and i got a theory about this and my theory is that a lot of the cool popular people who become personal trainers and stuff like that they work in gyms and what do they do they socialize in the gym with the other cool popular jacked trendy people who don't need their surfaces surfaces they ignore the people who actually need their help they're not friendly to them they don't say hi they don't they don't um, remember their name they don't offer to help them you know they walk straight past them you know and that's why i think so many coaches especially have struggled in the gym and they want to go online because they're like well it's easy to get my my shirt off and show myself online and that's what i have to offer the people but you know a lot of the times you know the people who really need your help don't look anything like you but i think people just kind of ignore them and that's why with my coaching you know yeah i put out a lot of results with advanced people but i try to put out results with um all, all kind of body types with your results i mean just looking across your portfolio they're phenomenal and there is a, a, a huge mixture of clients um and you know it's easy to look at your results and think that's the perfect picture of a highly skilled coach that's got world-class results um there must have been a time or a turning point in your career that influenced a change in the quality of results that started to get you noticed. And I I do believe that excellence is something that's always at the forefront of my mind. Every client can do better. Um, I have certain things in my mind, whether I'm business coaching now or teaching coaches to even get better results. I, I have like a, a set kind of list of things that I've always done inside of me to help somebody become more. What influenced and what were the kind of actions that you took as a coach that got your results from average to being noticed? You know, like I'm a big believer in the whole concept of like attracts like. And a lot of great results for me to not put myself down, but a lot of great results for me comes from having clients who actually also want that, you know? So you need to have clients who truly want to get an epic transformation and stuff like that. So not that's not for everyone and not every client. You can do an amazing job, right, with someone who doesn't lose any weight, but you help their mental health, you help their confidence in the gym and stuff like that. But that might not get you that transformation. So for me, I remember about, it must have been about eight years ago, I got a couple of good results and that's where I was like, oh, wow, you can post those. And then I started posting them and i didn't think much of it but then all of a sudden as i said like attracts like people see that and i started getting messaging back oh man i'd love to look like that for my 40th birthday and and what and whatnot so just the whole concept of you putting out something and then people seeing it and they think hey i want that that allowed me to start getting clients who actually want that so it's always a lot easier to get amazing results when you're actually getting people who have that same mindset they want to do that the last thing you want to do really as a coach is go get a client who has severe um, body confidence issues or eating disorder and then you go hey i want to use them to get a 12-week transformation i'm just going to crash diet them and stuff like that that's that's not you know being a good coach for the right client so for me a lot of the times was just seeking out the right clients or not so seeking out having clients seek you out because it needs to be you know a perfect match and that's where i think for what i do the best results come from you know as i said 
doing what you do. Like I know what I am, but I'm not trying to force it upon someone. I'm trying, I'm, I'm just, I know what I can do, but you need to also attract clients to actually want that and have that goal because it's not easy. You know, I've always kind of treated transformations with general population clients like a comp prep, just a very, very different comp prep because it's still, you know, you have a point A to point B, you have a goal, you have a, um, a you know, a, a goal date, you have a, you know, a certain weight loss target and things like that. And I've always tried to treat it really professionally. And what I found was that clients actually really loved that. They liked feeling like they're working towards something. And, you know, a lot of people, I think back in the day, kind of underestimated a lot of the general population's drive for getting great results. And, you know, it's like, oh, well, they don't want to be a bodybuilder. They might not want to be a bodybuilder, but they might want to look great for their holiday or their wedding and stuff like that. And so, yeah, so it was just putting stuff out there and, and people coming back to you saying, hey, I want that. And then what I did was I got then had people come to me and I got them great results, got them more results and then just kind of build on it. And then the, it's kind of like a flywheel, you know, you get, you get more people, you get better results and better people keep coming back and back. And then it kind of feeds off itself and just grows. Love that. A lot of coaches, whether it's personal trainers or online coaches, when it comes to females, now you look through your results and females is a bit of your, your thing. Um, you know, it's become a, you know, a, something you're recognized for. Um, you know, not only with the work you've done with your fi- fiance, Lauren, who's always, you know, she's fantastic. Um, and helped to achieve, uh, she got the WBFF, uh, world title, right? Yeah. Um, and I want to just talk about females and training, if I may, because you talked a few couple of minutes ago about almost exceeding people's expectations in the gym. Now, people don't want to look like that. People don't want to do this to the point where I feel sometimes guys and girls not under train, but don't necessarily help women to visualize what more could look like without the fear of them getting jacked. Um, what's your approach to training more of a general population female that would carry over to coaches that do want to help women believe that they can achieve more? You know, I'm all, I'm really fortunate because having trained women like Lauren and stuff like that, you obviously kind of build an audience of women who who appreciate what Lauren does. And they might not want to have the same amount of muscle, but they love how they train. They want to get strong. And so I, I've been really fortunate to have the last few years, again, attract women who mean business. They, they you know, they've often been told, hey, I, I, you shouldn't lift, you know, and, you know, back in the day, hey, you just go to do certain classes and whatnot. And so the last few years, I've definitely been very fortunate to have a lot of great clients and i was i think back in about 2019 or something i had about i think i had about six um clients and they all had over like a million followers um women and they were all over the world and that really got my name out there again with women and all of a sudden they got really great results um some of them um had these epic transformations and you know they had millions of followers and then the cool thing is when you kind of do get a great result with someone really, really well known, known that other people look up to and they see, and then women see, wow, the person I look up to looks amazing. They did that. It also, I think, opens up to their mind. Well, if they were lifting like this, then, you know, I guess it's okay. You should do that. And I, I really, I really think about probably about seven years ago, eight years ago, I think you, you start to notice a real switch in, um, um, social media with lifting and stuff like that, which is mm. cool. And it's just kind of grown and grown and grown. And someone like Brett Contreras, I always think did, has, uh, has done an awesome thing, you know, with the hip thrust, you know, whether you like the hip thrust or, or not, of course, it, of made, course. it was an exercise that women loved and it made them want to be in the gym. So I think Brett did an awesome job with that exercise, whether you like the hip thrust or not, make women want to be in the gym and you know it's just it's an age where you know you, you it's so easy to see other people and you know you can follow people and these days it's just so prevalent women lifting heavy and i think for the most part people are so much more clued on they understand that resistance training the b- benefits of it the longevity benefits the health benefits you know, even just the psychological benefits of feeling strong feeling good about yourself so for me it's i think it, as a coach it's easier than ever these days to kind of get that messaging across and therefore, I suppose from a coach's tip nowadays, it's even more important because from a female's perspective, yes, you can lose a little bit of weight. But if you can show somebody marked and measurable improvements in the ability for a woman to get stronger, then you're giving her more of a, 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 a their own KPI tracker of how many areas a woman can improve. And I think historically it's been, oh, well, I can help you lose weight. But if we can help a woman get stronger across multiple different exercises and progress and then talk to their female friends a coach has the ability to impact their friends and get their friends to be strong. Because I think that a lot of coaches, when it comes to females, kind of stop at that weight loss zone rather than the strength zone. 
And what are what are some of the, the key things that you would add to a coach's arsenal who is looking to kind of help women get stronger? What are some of the key markers? You know, we've got a lot of coaches that work with gen pop females. And I've never strayed away from a gen pop female getting strong on a hip thrust, eventually doing a squat if it's right for them or RDLs. But a lot of coaches stay away from those bigger exercises and getting women there. But they could be your biggest tool to help kind of develop a little bit of a, 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 a market for women, right? Yeah, like, you know, the funny thing is, if you <clears throat> if you want to have the skills of retaining clients long term, like for me, some of my online clients I've had for five plus years and, you know, they're paying four or five thousand dollars for 12 weeks with me and I've had them for five years, you know, so they're, they're paying, you know, a good amount of money and. You know, my client, Neuro, who last year won the WFF World Bikini title in the over 35s categories, that was our fourth year working together. And I trained her when she never won anything, um, never um, had competed, sorry. And a lot of the a lot of the things people I don't think realize enough is, as you kind of said, is that if someone just comes to you for, hey, let's lose six kilos, they lose six kilos in 12 weeks and they go, well, job's done. So yeah, thanks for that. And then you've lost your client. But if you go, cool. Let's work on our squat for the next 12 weeks. We're going to squat twice a week. Cool. I've added 10 kilos to my squat. Yeah, I lost six kilos, but well, I can now squat 50 kilos. Man, I want to hit a a goal of now squatting 60 kilos. So the next 12 weeks, you set a goal of let's work on the squat again. And then you go, all right, let's introduce low bar squat. And you can do phases. And and by having strength training on the big lifts, I really, really, really do believe that it makes clients want to stay with you. They value programming. You know, obviously my business is built around training programs. And, you know, I've had a lot of people in my kind of system in the last four and a half years have bought 14, 15 training programs of mine just back to back and they stay with me. They've got great results. They've already hit their body composition, but why are they staying? Because they like the training program. They like getting stronger. They like um, feeling um, improved. And the power of kind of strength training is you, I'm yet to really meet too many people in the world with their strength training and go, you know what? I'm happy. I don't want to get any stronger. You know, mm-hmm. they get, you'll reach a body fat and go, yeah, you know what? I'm happy with my body fat. I don't want, or hey, I'm happy with my muscle mass. But very rarely do you hear someone go, you know what? I'm happy with how many pull ups I can do. You know, it, it's, it's not one of those things. It keeps them coming back. And in regards to, you know, training women or general population clients, it's not just about, uh, hey, let's hit a one rep max squat. You know, for me, I, I recently um, released a pull up program. And why did I release a pull up program? Because for me, Honestly, there's no better confidence building for women to hit their first body weight pull up. That is the most boss feeling in that and having a goal for that. And, you know, it's not, hey, let's just add weight to the hip thrust and get strong hip thrust. I think too often, especially males training women, they underestimate a lot of their female clients drive to get on a variety of lifts. Like I've had my clients excited because they added a kilo to their lateral raises and all this stuff, you know, like women enjoy training. They feel strong and it's not this, you know, I've been back programming for Lauren, my partner again. And, you know, in the gym yesterday, we're doing um, a skewed pyramid of for her pull-ups and, you know, doing weighted pull-ups and stuff like that. And she was the most happy she's saying, you know, she had a good squat session, but the next day she was way happier because her pull-ups were improving rapidly. And it's not just about, hey, let's just squat more. There's so many ways to improve. And the other thing I really like with strength training, and sorry to go on with it, but the other thing I like with strength training is, let's say I use this kind of analogy or sequence, um, example is, let's say you have a client and they diet down in the first 12 weeks, they lose weight. The mirror is super validating, but then you go, let's get them out of a calorie deficit. Cool. We've hit our body comp, comp. Now let's get, let's get out of a calorie deficit. But the last few months, they're so used to the mirror being that validates them. And all of a sudden you're now putting calories on and they're gaining body fat and they're feeling terrible. But if you have actual strength goals for their client, yeah, they might not be getting the validation from the mirror, but they're actually looking forward to their, their gym sessions. Like, hey, week four of the program, let's hit 80 kilos for five on our high bar squat. They, they go into the gym with a purpose. And then another thing is, you know, you give them more calories they're in a building phase and they're actually noticing that, yeah, I'm on more calories. I might not be as lean, but I'm utilizing those calories. I'm getting stronger. I'm crushing my workouts. And all these factors really, I think, influence longevity in the gym, longevity of, you know, wanting to be in great shape. So I often have people say, you know, my programs, like you train these women to get strong on bikini and you don't need to do this. I'm like, yeah, that's correct. But I also kind of want clients who after their bikini comps and want to love training and keep training for the next 20, 30 years. And, and they're not psychologically bashed. Literally. And so when, the 
yeah, and so they have more to them than just, hey, I just have to do these kickbacks in case my waist gets this tiny, tiny bit too thick and stuff. So I think a lot of times coaches think too short term, like you can do all these things and you can build a really good training base for their longevity into their their future post post comps and stuff like that. And so the client goes through these cyclical phases because your knowledge is is so much so that you are conditioning. I always talk about either future pacing or being a visionary for your clients and actually say, right, as soon as we've come out of this show phase, we're going to be working back on those lifts. But part of your phase before they even dieted down was getting them mentally conditioned to enjoying lifting. And then they're almost talking about, yeah, cool. I know as soon as we finish this dieting phase, I'm looking forward to the next phase. So as a coach, that skill set of being able to be cyclical or having a periodized mindset of the year as opposed to just the dieting phase, increases customer lifetime value, right? Yeah. like Not just from a financial perspective, but from a psychological perspective, from an emotional perspective as well. Yeah, I think too, like obviously I have transformations and stuff like that, but with my programs and stuff like that, but at the end of each, you know, program or whatever they finish it's always like well here's your next program which is what we recommend to continue the journey it's like i have programs where it's like people like hey is it is your program is it a cut is it a cut phase i'm like well no it's just you've got choices you can cut or build like there's no program it's just resistance training and then we have our education around nutrition and that's one of the things is that i think people are just they think all right when it's time to get serious with training it means 12 weeks hardcore dieting and then I'm not serious. You can still be serious of training year round without being dieting at all. You can spend a year out of a deficit. You know, a lot of my clients who I've trained, my competed and stuff like that, they've hired me and they competed and, you know, they did the typical thing. I wanted to train. I wanted to get on stage. When I got on stage, I realized I had no, no muscle mass. I had no shape. And we've literally done a two year building phase. And then my client, Emily, last year, we did about, I think about two and a half year building phase. Basically, she came, I think, seventh or eighth in a comp before, before me. And then, um, we did two years of building and then she won the Australian WF, WBFF bikini comp last year. And her body was just dramatically different. You know, she got stronger. We had a shape, but again, it's that ability to think long term. And, you know, when I work with clients, it's, Primarily, they're normally working with me for you know one to two years, and even though it's a higher higher rate, it's it's not a mentality of hey, it's life or death the next twelve weeks. It's just hey, this is step one, this is step two. Then it's always re um, reevaluating goals every twelve weeks. And I think too often coaches just have this mindset of hey, I'm this transformation coach, and I get you a transformation, and then see ya. But then they don't realize that it's always a lot cheaper to keep clients than to constantly have to recycle the marketing, the sales and all that stuff to get new people in. And really as a coach as well, the most enjoyable aspect is building relationships with people. It's fun working with people for nine months, a year. You learn more about them. You can try a lot of different things, you know, like that's where the real, real fun is, is that, yeah, you could, you know, you got someone a good result, but then how can we make them get better and better and better? Love that. Now the entrepreneurial side of you, Mastery podcast for me, speaking to incredible coaches, experienced coaches like yourself. But a big aspect of what we do, and 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 you know, I'm, I'm sh- you know, a big part of your life as well is the um, is the business. You know, there's a lot of programs that you have. There's the there's the business side that you enjoy uh, a great deal. Uh, you've got a great platform. You've built a lot of programs. I've spoke to a lot of coaches over the years, and you know, their first thought is they'll see someone like you, and they go, "I'm going to go for these low price." coaching programs your audience is large therefore you have a good reach of people would your first line of attack for coaches be the program design route and selling individual programs if you had your time to start helping another coach get into the world of of online it's funny my um friend jenna who i coached she won the um her bikini com as well um she's a business coach or helps with um getting coaches kind of set up and she gets a lot of leads through me and pretty much everyone kind of comes to her and says, Hey, I want to be like Mark. I want to sell challenges. And, and she's like, well, you've got 3000 followers and you know, you, you want to sell on mass. And bef- the thing is you need to understand kind of like what you're trying to sell, like, and who, who you are and your perception of like, you know, how much something is, if you're trying to sell a hundred dollar program, if you sell 10, that's not much. And you know, you're not obviously going to be um, doing too much. So I think too often coaches look for the, the kind of guidebook, the challenge route too early. You know, for me, as I said, I was a coach for 11 years before I ever sold an online program. And the only reason I sold an online program was because I was just maxed out. I was at full capacity and we thought we'll try to just put something out there to see if people liked it. Um, And that's what kind of got me started in that route. 
and even before I was doing what I was doing, like Lauren and stuff like that, Lauren and, you know, Rachel Dillon's of the world and stuff like that, they were the ones doing challenges back in the day, but they had millions of followers. And now I think you see these days, everyone is trying to do a challenge. They've got 5,000 5, followers, which, you know, you're not going to be getting a whole lot of that as a percentage of those 5,000 people signing up. And it's not really doing much for you, or your brand, just trying to always kind of sell on mass initially. And for me, it's always about, well, and I, my opinion is a little bit different to other people, but I just think the best thing you could ever do is just be a great coach first and first and foremost. Go be a fucking awesome coach. Go train people for five, six years in a gym. Like if it was me, I wouldn't want anyone to be an online coach for the first few years. I'm pretty old school. I would say go work in a gym, work with people for a couple of years, um, build a base, see try to maximize that, get as much out of it as you can. Even though online coaching is quite different to in the gym, I still think so many people could benefit from that and then offer online coaching and get good at that. The thing is, when you're doing programs to the mass, it's really hard to know why things work and why things don't work. And a lot of the time you don't learn it. If you're just putting things out to the mass, you're not learning too much because you're not coaching to an individual. When you coach to an individual, you always learn a lot more. You learn from the good stuff, you learn from the bad stuff. And for me, coaching so many people, it then allows me now to, I think, get such great results when I'm programming to mass because I have a really good idea of like my client avatar. When I write a program, I have a very good understanding of like, who's this program for? Like I might have 10,000 people buy a program of mine, but I've always got like an avatar in mind when I create a program. Who Who is this for? And I feel like so many times these days, people don't have that understanding. They don't have that knowledge base. And then they're writing a program which just makes no sense or it might work for that one person, but then it's just way too much volume or way too little volume and stuff like that. So against... <laughs> Yeah, so pretty much opposite of what I think most people do these days is what I would do. And I suppose that... Sure that answer, no, 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 it, it, it does. And I think something that's an important point is, you know, sometimes sometimes the desperate need without any real skills to go online can take you one to two years to, to actually build a solid base. And whilst you're doing that, to have a few hours a day on a gym floor, which doesn't actually end up being 10-hour days in the gym, could be probably in, in your, you know... Um, opinion the best thing that a coach could do to just have a certain percentage of their week it doesn't have to be all of their week actually getting that confidence established on the gym floor right yeah and you also get better results like you know if you're coaching someone you get results that start to build up a portfolio of results that then you can you know advertise and stuff like that you know so results are so powerful but not just for marketing they're also powerful for you as a coach to build your confidence for me if i do a challenge and you know someone gets a life changing epic result amazing but it's always probably more rewarding when you have a, a pure one-on-one -on -one client come to you and they have all these problems and then you get them a result because you've been there every single you know week doing the check-ins doing the initial consult programming exactly to them um and it's a different skill set and you know you you probably see it all the time as well you know. I remember a couple of years ago on social media, like how many people were doing ads, you know, not many people for four or five years ago. Now, every day you go through your feed, every third thing's like an ad. And I click on the ad because, you know, I like to see what people are doing. I'm like, who's this person? And they've got 300 followers and they're doing these ads. For and it's like, mm -hmm. like, yeah, you're doing that. But what's going to be the ROAS really on that, you know, putting out that money and stuff like that. Could it probably not be more beneficial just to put out heaps of value? Don't ask for anything back in return right away. And I remember when I started my Coach Mark Carroll um, Instagram, I never sold one thing for about two years online. And because where I was working, I was full. I was working for a company. I was working for Clean Health. So I was on a salary. I was working for Clean Health on salary. I was lecturing. And so I didn't need clients. And I never tried to sell anything. I just built my audience. And then that's when I released my first program. Um, four and a half years ago, and the first time I released my first program, I sold 5,000 programs in the first week. And I think a lot of that comes back to the fact I never tried to get anything in return for two years of just putting out um, content, trying to put out a lot of value. Whereas these days, you know, it's always like a, people asking for something back from their audience before they probably added enough value first to justificate, justify getting something back from them. How has your relationship with money and wealth change as you've developed through your career and now in a position that you've got a lot of business and a lot of people that you help worldwide. Um, you know, something that's very rarely discussed in, the, in our industry is that there's a lot of coaches making a lot more money now um, online, you know, um, whether it's selling digital products or online coaching and people who are 23, 24, 25, building real, real 
wealth, but then struggling with this, you know, when I was younger, it was kind of like you were on a certain amount of salary, then you would earn a little bit more as a coach. And there was long periods of time where it was kind of static, but now there seems to be bigger jumps for people's ability to earn more money, but therefore that comes with a degree of emotional instability around money. How has your relationship with money changed um, over the last few years as the business has grown and and you've seen more return? I think I was actually pretty fortunate when I started to really make good money because I started to make good money after I had probably had a bit more maturity and I was starting to, you know, I, I, I was, you know, had salaries, you know, making six figure salaries, you know, this is not, not Instagram ball or kind of anything going to buy anything amazing, but I was starting to make good money where I was like, oh, wow, you know, I could potentially save for a deposit of a house and I want to, oh, you know, and I started to learn about that. So I was just reading all these finance books for a couple of years and, you know, I was just saving away slowly but surely to hopefully put a deposit down for an apartment in Sydney or whatever. And then when my, the, the business kind of took off, I was, I started making all this money. I had a much better financial education of understanding, hey, let's not throw all this stuff away. And I, I had a, my mindset, my mindset, was a little bit different to probably I think most people it's I think one of my biggest strengths and weaknesses uh, I always think oh well this could not last so how can I make sure what I, whatever I get in I can make it last so everything I got in for the first few years I just invested you know I bought 15 16 houses around Sydney and stuff like that when I started to make a lot of money and everything was like well because I hadn't made much money for the first ten years of my career, this new, this one one-off year when I started making all this, um, have all this financial success, to me it felt like, well, this is probably not the norm. Maybe this cool, but go back to not go back the other way. So I was like, well, cool. If this ends, what what do I have for, to show for at the end of that year or whatever? And so what I did was then obviously um, invest everything I had at the time for a couple of years, and that really kind of made me feel a bit more secure. That hey, you know what? If Instagram dies tomorrow and I go back to being, you know, a, a, a standard trainer, um, I, I've at least probably set my, you know, self up for life for retirement at, you know, 50, 55. And that's why I was always quite conservative. And once I kind of got a base, I then was a bit, you know, a bit more, had a bit more fun. You know, I, I bought Lamborghinis, I bought Ferraris and stuff like that. And I did that stuff, but that was after, you know, you have a an eight figure probably portfolio and stuff like that. So I did all the right things first, did the cars sold all the cars after a year or two, went back to investing again. And um, and that's what I do. So these days, you know, I enjoy, I love learning about finance. And I my thing is always just, you know, I like the idea of just things growing. And, you know, every, every time I get paid, I invest and put it put into conservative, quite thing, conservative assets and, and stuff like that. Because I, I, I just, I'm always thinking, well, if this ends and I just go back to being a regular trainer in the, in the gym, that's cool. But at least I've got something to show for it. I don't want to just be that guy in a club buying ta- buying tables and stuff like that. Not that I drink alcohol or anything. Um, but I think that's always been my mindset. And, you know, it, it, it also helped that I never got into PT to have money. I never got into it to be rich or anything like that. I became a PT, you know, because I liked being a personal trainer. And it wasn't, it wasn't that. It wasn't to be anything but, hey, I just wanted enough money to pay my bills. I remember when I was like 22, 23, I was like, oh, my goal is to make sixty thousand Australian dollars a year, which is about thirty thousand pounds, and that that would be I'd be content, you know, because I could pay for my bills, I could pay for um all the basics and stuff like that. And then my goal was to make more money, was just to be able to get a yard so I could get a dog and stuff. So I've always had pretty simple goals, um, which has allowed me to have a bit more of a, I guess, a grounded perspective of when things went well. And I also always think, well, if it didn't work go well forever, then what can I have to show for it after? What did uh... What did your phase? I'm sure, like me, there's there's uh, depreciating assets that we enjoy occasionally, <laughs> um, and as a result of having those things, people may see them and think that that's the right thing to do. But what people don't see is the non glamorous side of the investing, which you've talked about. Your more um, controlled investing, you know, the the, the more um, uh, the, the the real estate, the property side of stuff. Um, what what did you learn from diving into um, buying a lot of luxury relative to the investing into, say, property? And what was it that kind of pulled you out of it as much to just go back to doing the stuff that no one ever sees, no one ever really hears about? One of those feelings you get, right? Like when you invest into, say, property, 
it might not be a sexy feeling. Like, I, you know, I buy property I've never even seen. You know, it's like, well, there goes my money, and it's a property. You know, because I invest around Australia. It's just, you know, it's not something you go see, no one knows, you can't go show it off or anything like that. So it's quite a different feeling. So it doesn't give you that high, but then it gives you a deeper, I think, in your kind of soul that you're kind of doing the right thing. You're setting yourself up. So every time you do something like that, I feel like you're just stacking up kind of the positives for where you'd want to be at 45, 40, 50 and stuff like that. Whereas what I found was when I, I bought a car, the first car I ever bought um, was a, I bought a Lamborghini and I was like, you know, amazing, cool, epic. I felt so good. But guess what happened? After about a month or two, that, those good feelings start to wear off. And then I was like, well, I want that feeling again. So then I bought another car and then another car. And I was doing these things and you're kind of chasing that high. And it's just kind of life, you know, no matter what, even if it's your your dream car, within a couple of months, those feelings when you get in it wear off. Mm-hmm. And then you start to get the anxiety. It's like, oh, should I be doing this? And And is this best for me? And stuff like that. And even though I was doing it after I did a lot of positives, Something I found was, it's just that sense of, mm, is this is this the smartest thing? You know, am I doing it for the right reasons and stuff like that? Is this going to help get me where I want to be in 10, 15 years time? And you know, granted, you know, if you got the money and you enjoy it, go for it. You know, and for me, I I could afford it. You know, I was buying things in cash and stuff like that, so I wasn't going to get these massive, you know, loans I couldn't afford. You know, and so it wasn't like a a stupid thing, but it just wasn't well is this where I want to be? You know, I always think like, where do I want to be? You know, I want to be retired at 40. So it's like, is this helping me get to that goal? Is it taking me away from that goal? And another thing is you also realize pretty quickly that no one cares, you know, like you often like, oh, oh man, if I, I have a cool car or something, people are going to think all this stuff about me. No one cares. If they see a car driving past, they don't go, oh man, who's that guy? He's so oh, cool. Oh, they yeah, think, yeah. wow, that, that that's a cool car. You know, it's like, so it's like, it's one of those things. And, you know, would I like another car? Yeah, I love cars and, you know, I'd probably get another car in the future because I've stepped myself up again. But it's just one of those things that I don't regret it, though, because it was definitely kind of an experience of, of hey, you know, what? I, I achieved something and I did it. And, you know, and that's also good. You know, you don't want to live your whole life and never did anything, even just stack up my, all this, you know, financial wealth and have nothing to show for any good times either. So it's a balance and stuff like that. But I think, yeah, it's too often people jump to, they get a little bit of financial success and their first thing is to reward, reward themselves with something luxury. Whereas it should be, let's let's go really set ourselves up for the next 10, 20, 30 years by doing some of the really boring stuff financially. And then if things keep going well, then potentially look at doing something like that. And do you think sometimes when there's that immediate, I have to go and buy the luxury thing, it sounds like what, and I have this, which is really interesting listening to you because I can afford the things that I'd like. And even though whether you can afford it or whether you're you're, you're going to lease something or whether you're going to get a mortgage, wh- whatever you're going to do, some people don't necessarily have this sense check in their mind that says, like you said, but is this going to get me to where I want to get sooner or is it going to delay it even though I've got the money? So there's the two things of looking at that. One, which is, am I doing this thing to show other people that I've achieved success? So in introspectively, I have to ask myself, am I doing it for them? And then there's the other side, which is, well, I could do it. But then the same time, as you said, is even when I have it, it's such a short lived, gratifying feeling. It pulls you back to actually what's more important to you, which is actually setting yourself up for the future. So it's almost pulling you back. So would you say the first thing to do when you start to make more money, when you are impulsively going to go and spend a load of it, is the first thing to ask yourself if it's an aligning thing? goal with what you truly want or whether you're not you're doing it to show other people this is why i think it's important to learn about finances and stuff like that because once i start to learn about hey you know investing you know compound interest and stuff like that you buy you invest in yourself now and it just grows and grows and grows so my idea was like well you know what if i went back to just having kind of a normal pt salary but i've i've got all these properties and they pay for themselves. I don't need to do anything for the next 20 years. I just know they're going to grow and grow and grow, even if I, you know. So that was kind of the thing. And it's just that mindset of, I think, always asking yourself, like, is this is this choice going to help me get where I want to be? Or is it going to take me away from my goals? And a lot of these financial things you do can either take you closer or further away. And and that's one of those one of those aspects in life, though, it, you know, when you talk and you have wisdom and stuff like that, it's like, all right, cool, that makes sense. But until you live it and you get in that situation, you know, we're all humans. We all have things we we want, and we, you know, and for me, it was it was, it was never 
so much uh oh man i want to impress people you know i, I don't have many friends and stuff like that it's always more it was more so i wanted to say to myself you know I, I i can do this i'm in a place you know i've earned this and that was for big for me you know that's what i said i did all the right things and then i was like you know what i can do this but then i got rid of all the stuff as i said and went back to investing and even recently today i was actually talking to lauren's like man i'd love to get another car she's like well why not why you can now you've like you know you've done all that stuff and you've just where else does more investing kind of get you you know like you're, you're in a pretty good spot now you can do that but now it's just such a habit of always being like mm, do i need it do i need it and stuff like that and it's just I forget where what I is that. From, what what, what is what is that? What what is that part of you that says I get this sometimes? Do you need it? Do you need it? Is this you constantly questioning like what I'm doing it for? It's almost like there's a moral compass going on with what you're saying, and I have this too. Uh, it, it's interesting. It's it's one of those things of I think money. Is, you know, a lot of the times people are like, well, can I afford it? You know, can you afford this car? Can you afford this? And a lot of the justifications of them getting a loan and what like. You know, it's about, can you afford this thing? But just because you can afford it doesn't mean you should, you mm-hmm. know, so there's a difference between can I afford it or can it do, can it add value? Do I actually need to do it? So just because you can afford something in life doesn't necessarily mean it's going to add a lot of value. And it's one of those things, you know, like it's, if you have big goals, and that's why I'm really big on goals and financial goals and business goals and stuff like that, that can really hold you accountable, you know, when you're making decisions, because, you know, is this, I keep going back to, does, does this short-term kind of financial win make me deviate or get away from kind of success and you know if you're going to buy an expensive car the way you can also think of it is hey that could be mean five more years of working and not retiring five years early you know so is that car now worth you know that money could be invested and you know could have led you to retiring at 45 instead of 55 and things like that so that's the way i often think and you know mm. i like you know i'm a big fan of things like warren buffett and reading his you know that snowball you know just building and building and building and that's why these days you know i don't have any you know money in really in my accounts everything just instantly goes to different things and stuff like that i like feeling like there's not much there because again it makes you feel that you know you shouldn't you, you shouldn't go do go st- do stuff like that and if, if you really 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 want to because it's not there and it has to be an effort that's why i like property and stuff because you're, you're not very liquid with um with your um money and stuff like that with property and it can also hold you back from you know making spur of the moment decisions and stuff like that and you know so it, yeah just trying to sometimes sit back and think hey is this really the best thing for me right now um can often make you i think make a bit more logical decisions and not not too much emotion which is often not what you want in the with financial decisions are you uh you know as somebody who joined the fitness industry like me you know not joining it for the wealth side not i I joined it because i cared about coaching um your advice now to any coach joining the fitness industry about possibilities about opportunities, about, you know, what lays ahead for people, what would be your biggest piece of advice to a coach in their first couple of years now within the fitness PT or online? What, what, what's something that really stands out to you that says, you know, I wish I, 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 I want to make sure they understand this. One of the hardest things I think, and for me, and often doesn't feel like it at the time, right? Like, so a lot, a lot of things you, you learn in life is when you look back and not just, you know, going through it. You know, I feel like you often don't learn much when you're just going through those feelings. But looking back for me, a lot of it has been just the power of longevity and just sticking out something and actually giving yourself chance for, you know, time to occur. And, you know, you can look at in many ways, building, doing a building phase or, you know, investing and, you know, compounding and all these things. But I'm a big fan of kind of, yeah, I I like inv- I love investing, so I can kind of use it with your your PT career. Is that you know, like don't expect to be a great coach right away, and don't expect to also feel like you're always a great coach. I always go through phases. You feel really good. You feel on top of the world. You then you feel like oh wait, I learned more, and now I don't really know that much. And it's this, this constant up and down, up and down. But it it's kind of a you know, you'll go up and up and up, but you'll have periods where you feel down. But then over time, it's that like, it's not a perfect linear kind of progression, but over time, it's, it trends in the right direction. And I think though a lot of the time is probably because of the way of the world, I think coaches expect too many or too much success too early, you know, and these, these days in age, yes, it's easy to blow up on social media and stuff like that and be, you know, the trend and the flavor of the month and stuff like that. But going back to, I guess, the, the name of the podcast, you know, mastery, mastery is not, you know, a one hit wonder. Mastery is consistent, consistency. It's doing the little things well, often the non 
sexy, glamorous things, well, that no one sees. And it just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. So, you know, like I said, when I released my first program, it sold 5,000 programs in the first week. I was a coach for 11 years, you know, before that, you know, it just happened. That was the foundation to be able to do that. And now, you know, I, I have a larger audience, but just like anything, it just grows and grows and grows. And it's, 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 it's honestly one of those things that's, there's nothing easy about it. It's hard. There's going to be so many periods of feeling good, feeling shit, feeling really, really shit, wanting to quit. You know, I've wanted to quit this industry so many times, you know, at the start and even all the time, you know, it's like, you, you know, it is even the more kind of you do, the more you want and you move, but you're constantly also moving the goalpost. And, you know, where I'm at right now, some days I feel like the world's biggest failure, but right. But then I think, well, where I'm right now, I wouldn't have believed five years ago. So it's, it's, it's just one of those things where the goalpost is always moving. And you, I think for coaches, it's kind of understanding that it's longevity is such an important thing. So that's why, you know, we're getting results, having things that people enjoy, but trying to stay in the game, you know, it's like being able to stay in the game long enough to weather the storm, go through those bad periods and allow things to build and build and build and build and build. And that's where I think maybe not, you know, you might might not become a multi-millionaire, a billionaire or whatever and stuff like that, but you're probably going to be in a lot better place if you stick at these kind of things than if you're constantly chopping and changing and leaving every industry after a year because you're not um, financially successful yet. Well, that was a fantastic way to uh, bring our really diverse but incredibly enjoyable, and I know uh, incredibly enjoyable podcast, but to so many coaches out there that really haven't had that 360 degree approach or thought process to their career across multi multiple different areas. I just want to thank you um, because, you know, the depth of from coaching through to developing your brand to, you know, having a, a, a relation, a great relationship with money. Um, it's been an incredibly valuable conversation. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I appreciate having me on. It was a good chat. Yeah, it really, really was. And uh, I know a lot of coaches, you know, if you've got to, where are we now? Like an hour and 20 minutes into this, I could carry on with Mark. We, we have just uh, an opportunity to just delve into this again and we, we should do it another time. But um, Mark, just in terms of, you know, I'm a big believer in buying people's stuff. You know, I bought as I'm sure you have over the years, I, I click, I'm very click heavy and I'm very, very Apple pay heavy on buying people's stuff. I've always wanted to see what people's you know programs were. Um, I remember back in the day with John Meadows, every time he brought something out, I would buy it, I would go through it. Then I hired John and I went through it. Um, I wanted to see different people's methodology who always have. Where can people find out about you, your work, your programs? Um, I think it'd be an incredibly valuable resource for people to learn from. Yeah, I'm- on coachmarkcarroll.com is where I have all my programs and, you know, so many trainers, like, yeah, a vast, vast amount of trainers use my programs and learn. And, you know, I think it's always good to, you know, see what our coaches are doing and, you know, like the whole success leaves clues, you know, so that's why I think it's always good to learn from people. And I think a lot of the times these days trainers are a bit too hesitant, you know, you should invest into others and, you know, it's just like you should, you know, you should go into other people's emails and see how they do their emails. You see how they do their marketing. And obviously, you know, if you're a trainer and you want to see how someone else does things and also seeing their programs and, you know, even implementing them yourself, you can always learn a lot. No, well, that's, uh, that's incredibly valuable advice and, and something that a lot of, I think, a lot more modern coaches, you know, you and I were so heavily involved in that education era whereby we were traveling, we were mentoring, we were buying, we were investing. Um, I think there's a lot, a lot of money that's invested in the content creator, the videographer, there's the attention seeking, potentially still validating, still important part of running your business. But, but in the trenches before, because that wasn't there, you had to become smart before you became known, right? So, uh, I think getting reinvesting into other coaches and understanding what they do is incredibly valuable. Um, Mark, I'm very grateful for your time. Thank you. And, uh, I look forward to doing this again, but thanks for your time. Thank you very much.